for the second lecture for this week, we're now going to look at some specific law enforcement executive positions. So in the first lecture, we talked about like generally the administrative jobs, the um, chief executive jobs for law enforcement. So now, right, and like what their functions and required qualifications and all of those things are. Now we're going to look specifically at actual positions that exist within law enforcement and what their duties, qualifications, and obligations would be, okay? So, like I said, we are going to start talking about specific positions in policing. So, who are the law enforcement executives? So, if you're thinking about the very top positions of law enforcement agencies, what are those called? So, what is the boss, the main boss's title? So it depends. If you are in a municipal department, it's going to be chief of police. If you're in charge of a county law enforcement agency, you would be the sheriff. Okay. So those would be the names of the chief executives for the different levels of law enforcement. Now, We've talked about these before, but in general, what would be their main duties? Well, they would be broken down into three main categories. If you are the chief executive of a law enforcement for like a town village or city, or for a sheriff for a county, you have different expectations depending on how you look at it. So you would have governmental expectations. So you are a governmental official. So you have duties and obligations to carry out um, the functions of government. You owe duties and responsibilities to the members of the organization, which are gonna be your employees. So you owe a bunch of duties to just them. And then you are a governmental public employee. So you owe expectations and duties to the citizens. So when you think about either chief of police or sheriff and their duties and responsibilities, you have to think about them at three different levels. What do they have to give back for the government to keep the government running? What do they have to do for the members of the organization or the employees? And what do they owe the citizens in which that they are patrolling? Okay. Now, when you're talking about general education and skills requirements for these top positions, uh, usually it requires some level of college education. Now, it doesn't always, if you're a really small department, they may not have any educational requirements at all. But as you go into larger departments and you have larger pools of people to hire from, they're probably going to require higher levels of education and training. Um, we do know that they generally are going to look for several years of progressive management. So that means that you've started um, managing certain employees and then you've moved up through the ranks and you're developing those um, police management experiences. So you know what you're doing, you know how to operate the department. Um, we talked about this before, you wanna be motivational. That was one of the things we talked about at the very beginning of the class because you owe obligations to the members of your organization. So you want to be uh, motivational. And also we talked about the need to be a good communicator. So remember, you owe obligation to the government. So you need to be able to communicate well with other governmental officials. You need to uh, owe responsibility to your employees. So you have to be able to communicate effectively with your employees or the members of the organization. And then you still owe obligations to the citizens. So you have to be able to communicate and operate within um, the system and communicate to the citizens of your jurisdiction. Now, we're gonna break it down, chiefs of police, and then we're gonna talk about the sheriffs because they're very different functions. So we need to think of how they're organized and structured. So we're gonna talk about chiefs of police. Now, remember with chiefs of police, we're talking about city, town, and village, those types of municipal law enforcement agencies. If you are the chief of police, again, you are the top official of a municipal department, again, city, town, or village type of thing. Now, chiefs of police are generally hired by the jurisdiction's manager. So city manager, county manager, it, whoever it is that runs that um, jurisdiction, they hire you. So some of the things that we talked about with hiring, uh, collecting or coming up with traits and skills, posting, and then advertising, and then um, interviewing, all of those are the steps you would go through for chief of police. 
you have to go through an actual hiring process and whoever is in charge of that whole municipality, mayor, you know, whoever it is, they're the ones that are going to ultimately make the decision who is going to be the chief of police. Um, when they become chief of police, they become part of the whole jurisdictions management team. So if it's a city, you become part of that management team. You're gonna work with the mayor or the city executive or whatever they call it. You're gonna work with that management team. You're part of the top echelon of that um, governmental municipal organization. Now, it's often very political. So whoever is in control of that municipal um, thing, like the city, town, or village, they are going to most likely want to hire somebody that has the same political philosophy and views of law enforcement that they have. So you see, you often see that these positions are very, very political. So you have to be in a line with the political party of the person that's running that um, municipal um, jurisdiction. Now, so uh, qualifications can vary widely from municipality to municipality. It's often, like we said, you go through and you come up with the skills and the qualifications that that municipality thinks are most important for its chief of police. And they come up with that list. So what's the educational level do they want? What experience do they want? What management skills that do they want? And what do they think they can attract to that municipality? So if you don't have a large pool, you may not be able to uh, require quite as high of an educational level that some other um, municipalities may require. So size of the municipality often can lead to why they vary from um, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Now, one of the things we know about chiefs of police is that it turns over fairly rapidly. So the tenures of chief police chiefs tend to be shorter than 5.4 years. That's like the general average of the job. And so you gotta think why, why are they of such short tenure? And one of the reasons is because they are political positions. So if the political parties change at that municipal, the person that's running that judicial municipality, if it's a different political party, it switches political parties, they're gonna want, again, somebody in that top executive position of chief of police to be of their same political party. So a lot of times they leave their positions because somebody new is gonna be appointed by who's ever in charge of that municipality. Uh, sometimes because of that, that turnover, because it's so based on politics, they don't, uh, chiefs of police don't like that. So they may just leave because they want to seek out a position that has more stability, that they're not gonna just be you know, kicked out whenever the political whims take over. Another thing that happens a lot of times is if there's any sort of large sort of crisis during their tenure, they t tend to leave after that uh, because there's usually a lot of fallout politically. Sometimes there's scandal. Uh, a lot of times the chief of police is blamed if things don't work you know, exactly correctly. Um, so think about it. If there's a police shooting they're gonna blame the chief of police, even though it was probably an officer, patrol officer that engaged in that behavior. It's gonna fall back on the chief of police as the person that hired them and trained them and all of those things. So because of those scandals or political fallouts, a lot of times they are booted from their position because the executor of that municipality wants to blame somebody for it occurring. And so they'll fire the chief of police. So you see that. Um, again, there's also shaky alliances. There's also a lot of power struggle, things like that. Now, because of this high turnover, it often causes problems with chief of police. So if you think about every five years, you're going to get a brand new boss and they completely could change their style of policing and how the departments run. It can ca cause significant problems. So you can't really make a lot of long-term planning because it could turn over very quickly. So you're kind of thinking more of the here and now and not certainly long-term types of things. And we just said, every time there's turnover, you're gonna have changes in styles of policing. So new policies, procedures, regulations. And a lot of time um, they can't really develop alliances with other people and form strong power base because it's such a quick turnover. So that's one of the issues with chiefs of police. Okay, so now let's switch to sheriffs. 
So sheriffs are the top executive of a county law enforcement agency. So it's the sheriff's department, right? So the sheriff is the chief um, law enforcement officer of any county. These positions are very different. Remember, chiefs of police are appointed by a political party usually. With the um, sheriffs, they are actually elected. So they are elected officials. They run for office. And so um, they tend to be more independent from those other branches because the people have picked them, not the political party that's running that municipality. So they don't have to abide by everything that the um, mayor or the chief executive of that municipality says because they aren't hired by them and they can't be fired by them. They are elected by the people. Now, what do they do? They are in charge of multiple functions. Law, chief of police are just mostly responsible for their department. Sheriffs are responsible for many things. They do manage the police department, but they often have court responsibilities. So a lot of times they provide security and um, screening and things like that in the court system. So they have a lot of court responsibilities. And then they're also often responsible for corrections because they also run the jails. The county jails are run by the sheriff. So they have a much bigger um, duties, list of duties and responsibilities sheriffs do. Now, what is their qualification? Just get the most votes. So sometimes you see people that have not are not even law enforcement background at all. So we said chief of police, we like to see that progressive management. You don't see that with sheriffs. You just have to be somebody that wins an election. So it is surprising, but every once in a while there's a sheriff that is elected that has never um, served as a police officer in their entire career. So that can happen. And they generally run for two to four year terms. So it just depends on what your jurisdiction sets for its uh, terms for the county. Now, remember that are the top official for the county and there's lots of diversity. So with the sheriffs, because it's an elected official, you can have some older, some younger. It's like, you know, it can be a wide diversity of different people. It does tend to be people just statistically that are a little older. Um, they're less likely to be promoted from within. Now, sometimes when the sheriff leaves, they do the next person in line will run for the office and they often win. But that is not a guarantee um, because anybody can run for that position. So it's not always promoted from within like we've talked about. Um, and a lot of times they have less special, special knowledge, special training and less college because that may not be a significant issue with people electing them. It's gonna be more political philosophy because they're elected officials. Now, so those are the top executives. Now we have people that are what we call middle management. These are like your captains and like your lieutenants. So remember, we have the, the top on the very top. And then the next round are people that take the policies and procedures that the chief wants and they make sure that they're carried out through the department. So that's your captains and lieutenants. So they're going to coordinate the organization as a whole. They're still looking at it as a whole, not a day-to-day -day job type, day-to-day -day, like patrolling type of job. They're still trying to um, have the administration of the whole agency. And they're trying to carry out the directives of the sheriff or um, the chief of police. Uh, so they're trying to assure that all the other people in that agency are carrying out that organization's mission. So we talked about mission statements and that's their goals and responsibilities. Middle management's job is to assure that those are carried out. And they are supervising people underneath them to assure that the mission of the department is being carried out. Now, underneath them, you still have supervisors it's the first line supervisors so they're often the patrol sergeants so their job is to supervise the actual patrol officers they are going to direct and control the day-to-day -day line operations of that organization so 
they're going to make sure that the policies and procedures are followed by the patrol officers, that the patrol officers are patrolling, that they're writing tickets, that they're making arrests. They're going to supervise those patrol officers. They also may be responsible for allocating individual resources to those patrol officers. So the higher management is going to decide what to buy and when to buy it. The line officers may be dispersing it to individual patrol officers. They're often also responsible for resolving conflicts. So if different officers have conflicts with each other or with the public, they're the ones that are going to try to negotiate and figure out those things. And they are also going to be responsible for the performance evaluations of the patrol officers to make sure that those patrol officers are doing their job. Now, when you talk about um, first line supervisors, you can kind of break them down into certain types. Again, this is very stereotype, but different patrol officers, I'm sorry, patrol sergeants have a lot of times different philosophies on their job and how their job should be carried out. So the, the traditional one is really what we call law enforcement oriented. Um, they want their patrol officers to produce a high amount of measurable activity. So how many tickets are they writing? How many arrests did they make? They emphasize report writing and numbers and statistics on showing what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they tend to focus more on punishment than reward. Like if you're not writing five tickets then you're going to get the crappy places to patrol. So that they tend to use that. Um, and they may have moral and motivational problems with subordinates because they're just going to be focusing on numbers, numbers, numbers. Innovative are often more associated with community policing. So they're going to want their officers out there doing problem solving, working with the community, um, uh, interacting with um, the community. They may not be paying attention to how many tickets are written, how many arrests are made, because they want to keep that number down. They want to get out there and do problem solving to stop those things from uh, occurring. They develop um, relationships with stronger with the community. Uh, they tend to be good mentors to the patrol officers. Um, they view themselves more as a coach than as a boss. They're there to be a mentor and a coach. Um, they are usually open to new ideas and innovation. So if a patrol officer has a good idea on something, they're open to that and they're, and they're willing to listen to that. Um, support it. Supportive are ones that believe that the most important thing is to have good relationships with the patrol officers. They want them all to like them. They want to um, make sure that um, they're their friends, that they get along with them. Uh, they, do they do tend to develop strong teams. And the idea that we're all part of this together makes sense. Mm -hmm. We're all one of the boys or one of the, the people, so team camaraderie. Um, and they may neglect goals and responsibilities of the organization, the mission of the, uh, um, of the organization, because they're really focused on just everybody liking them. They want everybody to like them. Active are ones that don't like to delegate. So instead of having the patrol officers out on the street doing stuff, they'll show up and they'll start taking over and doing the things that the patrol officers would traditionally do. So they tend to work in the field. They tend to have good relationships with the, the patrol officers because they are seen as hard workers and they work hard and they're always there to help out. But they um, may become too involved on the day-to-day -day jobs. They should be allowing the patrol officers to do a little bit more on their own and developing their own skills. And they may not be allowing those patrol officers to develop their own methods and things. They're kind of control freaks. They want to take control of everything. So how do you get to, to move up in these different ranks? How do you move up? So you start as patrol officer, how do you move through? In law enforcement, it's all decided by promotional civil service exams. So that is how you would move up in the ranks. You have to take these tests, okay? Now, let's talk about the actual, excuse me, patrol officers. 
one of the main duties and responsibilities of all executors or managers within the law enforcement, one of their most important jobs is to hire and train new patrol officers because you're always going to have turnover. You're always going to have new officers coming in. So as an executor in a law enforcement office or agency, you have to constantly thinking about hiring and training. So who are we going to hire? How are we going to train them? So hopefully you remember from other classes that we talked a lot about police subculture. So remember police subculture are sort of the values and morals and beliefs that um, are developed within the law enforcement organization itself, right? So we know that police have their own sort of subculture, their own beliefs and how things should be done. So when we hire, we want to make sure that it's somebody that's going to fit within that police subculture. Now, if you have a style of policing that's more watchmen, rough them up and things like that, you're going to probably have a little bit different police subculture than if you are a community policing agency. So you need to hire and train somebody to fit into the police subculture that, um, that is perf good for your department. And all of that comes with socialization, like your, the patrol officers are learning this subculture through the socialization process and their interaction with other people in the department. Okay, so it's really important to think about these things because if you want to make sure that you are having an ethical and uncorrupt police department, you have to be very, very careful in who you hire, you don't want to hire people that could um, not fit into what your expectations are for that department. So what are some things that we're going to look for for hiring and training? Incorruptible. So we want people that have very high moral standards. We want that as a police subculture. Well adjusted that you can you know adjust to different situations because all law enforcement have to adjust quickly to different situations. Be able to handle stressful situations and not just freak out when something is stressful because you're going to face stressful situations. You don't want thin skinned. You want thick skinned. So because you're going to get yelled at by the public, you're going to be you know treated nasty at times. You're going to be able to tolerate that and listen. You know and not you know, abuse your discretion because somebody mistreats you. You want people oriented because you're, that's your job. You are working with the people. You don't want it to be that's highly emotional, quick to anger, anything like that, over aggressive or impulsive. And you want high thinking skills because if you are community policing and problem solving, you want people that are going to be able to think through those processes. So you want those. And then this is the 12 top qualities that they are looking for for entry level patrol officers, enthusiastic, good communicator, good judgment, sense of humor, creative, self-motivated, understand the job and what your role is in the system, uh, um, self-confident, but not egotistical and having courage. Okay, so you have to think about that. You're the administrator, you're running the department. You have to think about that process of who are you going to hire? What are you looking for when you hire? Okay, now one of the things that's often brought up is should law, should the executors be able to access all candidate, candidates' social media? So one of the things is, that they often look at all your Twitter accounts, all your Instagram accounts, all your Facebook accounts. Should they be able to, if they're private, <clears throat> should they be, should the candidate be required to turn over access to the department so they can scrutinize all that social media? Some people say, no, that's private. That's their personal lives. You shouldn't be able to. Other people say, <clears throat> we're giving you tremendous discretion and power, we need to be able to access these types of things. So that's your discussion for this week. I want to uh, know what you think about that. So one of the things we know is we have to screen people to assure that they have those qualifications. And we also want to know that once we've hired them, are they going to be properly trained? So we have to decide as like the chief executive or the middle um, management, who are we going to allow to train these patrol officers? Because we know that they're going to learn police subculture and socialization from the first people that train them. 
So we know that they learn to join the police academy. So we want to know who are we hiring and what are they, what are they doing in the police academy. We want to know what officers they're working with. We want to know who they're with when they make their first felony arrest or use of force. So as a chief administrator, we have to be very, very careful of who we're allowing to be the trainers. We don't want anybody just to be a trainer. We want to be very careful who we are allowed to be the trainers to work with these officers because they're going to have a significant impact on what they learn and the police subculture. So you also have to decide what is the training that you're going to require for your department. Now, somebody or police officers always have to go through some sort of police training. Okay, so they're going to academy. So they're going to have to go and learn the book and the laws and all of that stuff and physical training and physical requirements and skills. They're going to have to learn all of that through some sort of traditional police academy. And then they're always going to have to sort of do ride alongs for a while with somebody that's already within the department. Now, originally, the way they did this training is it was very skill based. Can you handcuff? Can you like here's the handcuffs. This is the steps one, two, three that you have to follow. And it was very rigid and you had to be able to repeat those very specific things. This is a takedown. This is a vehicle pullover. A, B, C, D. And then when you're graded. Do you hit each of those things perfectly and you check them off? That has really changed over the last just few years. They're really switching the philosophy of police law enforcement training. They're going to show you how to handcuff, but they've learned that everybody does it a little different. It doesn't have to follow a precise thing that the general rules of how you should do it are gonna be taught. But you have to be able to problem solve because there's going to be situations where what you were taught isn't going to work. So think of this example. You go to arrest somebody and handcuff them and they only have one arm. Now what do you do? If you were given one, two, three and you only followed one, two, three, you can't think that fast to know what to do. There's no muscle memory. So we've really started to switch our training methods to more problem-solving applications. So we'll demonstrate to you what you should do, but then we're going to throw you in different situations and see how you respond and how you adjust and how you can problem-solve through that situation to come up with the proper solution. So as the chief executive of an organ law enforcement organization, you have to think about those training procedures. Not only who are you going to hire, but once you're hired, how are are we going to train them to be the best that they can be in their position? And that's all the jobs of the executors of that organization. They have to decide on those hiring decisions. They have to decide on the training decisions. So those are all jobs that fall to the chief executive. So just to think about, we're not obviously in class, so you can't do this, but I want you to think about it. You are the chief administrator and now you're hiring new officers. What would be a list of traits that you would want from a new patrol officer? And what training process would you like to implement if you were responsible to assure that the officers that you're hiring are properly trained and can perform the functions? So just kind of give it some thought and that makes you kind of think through the material and then see if you actually understand it. Okay, so that's it, not too long. Um, so hopefully it makes sense to you. And then also make sure you're still working on your research project. So make sure you watch the video explaining the next phase of your research project. So have a good night, I'll see you soon.